Listeners, readers, welcome back to the third chunk of our lecture on Rachel Kong's incredible Goodbye Vitamin. Goodbye Vitamin. I don't know if you could hear me from behind the book. I held it up in front of my face. Uh, okay, I am so excited to dig into this last chunk of the novel because I just found it so satisfying. It was a book, um, you know, we've dug into the structure and this amazing chronology and these digressions and the way that she's meeting out information. So one other aspect, today we're gonna talk about the arc, the character arc, and then we're gonna talk about the humor and the close of the novel. Um, I am someone who is totally fine with a character not having an arc. So if you are in an MFA program or you are a writer, uh, everyone will tell you that the reader is most satisfied if a character goes through changes. You wanna see a character learning something or you wanna see a character growing or you wanna see a villain you know, coming to justice, whatever the, whatever the thing is. Um, I think more and more people are kind of, I mean, any succession watchers out there, I think people are getting more and more comfortable with this like idea of it being also very satisfying, uh, this idea that people don't change because I think we all know that it's difficult to change and it's satisfying in a novel and yet plenty of people don't. And so it's also really interesting to see, you know, how, how characters can stay the same regardless of what is happening around them. But this was a novel where I felt that, that the arc and the sort of the, the changes that our Ruth goes through were so satisfying and, and a really, uh, I think one of the real assets of the novel. So let's look at page 50 and 52. I made an allusion before to the fact that she's not particularly happy with her professional life. And uh, this is a little indication of that. So um, kind of down here in the uh, bottom of page 50. I'm flattered too easily is my problem. One of them anyway, which I love that. I mean, again, vulnerability. If you want people to love your character, show them all the flaws. This is why a person would, seven months shy of finishing college, decide to drop out. I'd had pretty good grades. So that is someone, I mean, I love the way this is done. She's seven months, she's almost done with college and she drops out. And then this notion of I'd had pretty good grades. You have this real sense of regret and this real sense of potential lost, which is interesting. And this is one of those things that she kind of drops this in there that she never finished college. And then we are, you know, moving right along with some interesting digression or some interesting kind of interpersonal thing that's happening. But it, but it does, it speaks to this kind of dissatisfaction with her professional, uh, professional life. So then two pages later down at the bottom here, I try not to make a habit of playing out the possibilities if I'd finished college. I'd have been this or that or something else. It's a game I try not to play because it doesn't end any way but the way that it does, the way that it has. It was idiotic of me not to finish school though, idiotic and stupid. And now what? So I love this. I mean, this is 50 pages in to a novel that is what, 200 pages long? It's perfect. I mean, it's a quarter of the way in and, and, and she's really sort of laying this groundwork for the need for personal development. It's very clear. It's, it's you know, we, like there's a lot of kind of ways that this can go that will feel very organic and satisfying. So we have this idea of her professional life as being dissatisfying, but there are also other elements where we do see personal growth, which is maybe one of the reasons why I found this, this character arc and her growth so satisfying is because it wasn't just, you know, this kind of more obvious idea. So one of the things she says at one point is, is this a thing? Lately, I'm more forgiving because she was talking about old men and their maladies. So it's this sense of like, is this a, like, is this a thing? Like, am I, am I becoming more compassionate? And which is, it, it could be heavy handed, but it's just not like, it's so again, organic. And it's something that, you know, it's the best case scenario in terms of like overcoming a breakup and watching the decline of your father, like up close and, and, and sort of sorting through, you know, your father's alcoholism and your parents, you know, troubled marriage. So there's this idea of not only is she sorting out her professional goals and what she wants to do with her life, but there's also this sense of like, wait, am I getting more compassionate? Um, because she was talking about um, the, these old men. So up on the top, which is significant, of course, because her father is, is becoming one of them. Uh, on page 73, she says that she had been complaining about old men who were out um, that look like they're washing their driveways and whatnot. 
But now it occurs to me that maybe these old men have maladies, diseases that affect their manners and should be pardoned. So you have, again, this could be heavy handed because she's sort of like learning this thing from the experience with her father, but it's so well woven into all of these different elements that it feels significant, but also kind of not because it's embedded so nicely. It, it just seems to really uh, come not heavy handed. It, it, it's a slight thing and yet is, you know, obviously also very significant. Okay, we're looking at 79 to see more of her growth. Uh, and then, so here she is again, this is kind of more of that personal growth on 79. A long time ago, I stopped wondering why there were so many crazy people. What surprises me now is that there are so many sane ones. I mean, that is so great. And what a great thing to kind of come to terms with. Also, we are understanding here that she means she herself is a little crazy. Her father's a little crazy. Everybody around her is a little crazy. I also, again, I'm just going to call out the way that this book is structured with all this white space, all the space breaks. So this kind of aphorism, it's almost like a nice little saying. You could get that tattooed on your body. Um, but but you have this idea of this as a standalone concept, and it just makes it feel kind of like poetry or or like an inspirational quote of the day. But it really is also a very cogent and a very salient um, idea and an indication of her personal growth. We're going to look at 128 and 129. Again, chronology is our friend. We're just marching through the novel looking at her personal growth. So this one is a little bit longer. And Part of her growth, of course, is this, um, again, this is a very good testament to her pacing, because in the beginning, we have this idea of like, I'm not very satisfied with my professional life. And then we have this like, oh, but wait, also, maybe I'm becoming a more compassionate person. And I understand that everyone's a little crazy. And then we have this really nice kind of um, evolution of what is happening with her and her and her family. So on page 128, she's able to sort of come to terms and, and make some peace with, and also just be honest with, with her mother in this case. So it's, it's, we have a space break and it's her mom talking to Ruth. Why couldn't you visit Ruth? She asks quietly. Why couldn't you manage to visit? This, I don't know how to answer. Truthfully, I didn't want to see you suffering. I didn't want my fears confirmed. It was less terrifying this way, not helping you, not saving you, not leaving you all alone. And then quietly, she adds, this wasn't how I thought it would be. This is the mother saying, this wasn't how I thought it would be. It, I say, having a daughter, she says. Ouch. I mean, this is, again, like Ruth is really growing up here. You know, she's really like, really showing us how it feels to have your mom just be like, this is not what I thought it was going to be like to have a daughter. That's so painful. Um, and she says, there's, there's a last part. She removes her gloves and hands them to me all without saying a word. It's fine. She says quietly, leaving me to finish the dishes. So good. I mean, this is so well done. So again, you have this domestic novel, they're, they're doing the dishes. They're wearing gloves, which I just love the rubber gloves and dishes concept. It just seems so um, perfect. You know, it's also, um, it's actually a very nice echo of her dad and his hands. And, you know, there are there, some motifs throughout the novel that we're actually going to discuss. But th this real confrontation with her mom that is left undone. I mean, it, and she doesn't answer her mom. Like that, the, when I read that stuff up above, that is not her, she was not answering her mother. It was not in quotation marks. This is what she's saying to herself, but she says nothing to her mom. So we have this opportunity for growth that hasn't quite taken place. And frankly, I wouldn't be dissatisfied if it doesn't because it's very difficult to work these things out with family members. Um, let's look at 131 and 32, a little further along. Um, and then down at the bottom of 131, it's all so messed up. I think what it is, is that when I was young, my mother was her best version of herself. And here I am now, a shitty grown up and messing it all up and a disappointment. What imperfect carriers of love we are and what imperfect givers. That the reasons we can care for one another can have nothing to do with the person cared for that it has only to do with who we are around that person, what we feel about that person. Here's the fear. She gave to us and we took from her 
until she disappeared. I mean, this is our Ruth really doing some soul searching, which is so good. Again, this is this process of, of, of you know, understanding and of growth that she is undergoing. So now we are on 150 and we're kind of back to this thread of Joel and, you know, Joel and then Franklin with the two-year-old Davy. And then we, of course, she's been having this kind of, uh, you know, interaction with Theo, who's so amazing and such a sweetheart and goes to all of these sweetheart. This is sweetheart. I sound like I'm 90 years old. Um, he seems great. Seems like a great guy. And he is a graduate student of her father's and he is the one who goes to all this trouble to sort of create this whole illusion for Howard that Howard is still teaching. It's, I mean, speaking of compassion. And I think that we can understand that her relationship with Theo is, is she's well, also, it's just occurring to me right now, Joel and Theo, you know, you have that same, the vowel, it's a different combination, they're flipped, but Joel and Theo, you have that same E-O sound, which is really very beautiful. Uh, for my mind, Theo is also, it's a better, it's a better name than Joel. Again, apologies if your name is Joel or Howard. Um, but right here, we have this really kind of beautiful way that her relationship with Theo is developing, which is kind of a continuation of like, what is her romantic life going to look like? You know, one of the big preoccupations with the novel is, is, you know, overcoming heartbreak after her breakup with Joel. Okay. So right here um, in the middle of page 150, Theo and I, they're on, it's a 4th of July and they're having like a barbecue. Theo and I clink our warm lemonades together than our cold hot dogs, which that's so funny. It's so charming. Such great little details there. Do you have a picture on your phone? I ask. Who, he says, the most severe, I say. Only if you show me yours, deal. So what they're talking about here, and actually it's perfect that I didn't give you more context because for them, it's also a little bit out of the blue. She's really upping the ante in the relationship because what she's asking about here is the most severe heartbreak, the most severe kind of damage done to you. And I love, I mean, this was so funny to me because when she says it to Theo, like, do you have a picture of your most severe heartbreak? And he says, only if you show me yours. I don't know about you, but that was like that classic refrain of like, like, if you show me like your underwear, I'll show me like only if you show me yours. Like, it's like a weird, like playing doctor when you're young. I mean, this, am I the only one who did this? Oh my God. But like that idea, I think this is like a common thing. Like, show me your blah, blah, and you'd be like, only if you show me yours. I mean, now it's sounding really, like, yuck. But I don't know. Felt very innocent at the time. <laughs> I don't know. But I like this idea because there is that nuance, at least for me. Maybe it was just me. But that thing of, like, she's like, show me your show me your photo. And he's like, only if you show me yours. There, There is kind of this nice kind of joking kind of, and they, their relationship is full of this kind of joking and, and this kind of really nice, witty kind of repartee. So right across the page here, uh, we have Theo talking about the picture uh, of, of the woman who broke his heart most severely. I detect something like pride in Theo's voice talking about her. It's not overt, but it's there. I notice the pride because talking about Joel, I can hear the disappointment in my own. And then there's a little space break. She's very pretty though, I think later. Who cares, who cares, who cares? I chase the thought. So I love this. Again, this is, it's so, it's such amazing plot development and character development both, because what we're having here is this question of like, she and Theo, things are kind of heating up a little bit. They're talking about heartbreak. And then we also are having her work through the issues with Joel. I mean, she's talking about disappointment here. Um, it, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's not super clear to the reader here, this idea, you know, he's, pr he's proud of this woman, it's not, it this is the part that's not totally clear to me. I think he's proud of, of how she looks because she's very pretty, but also maybe proud that he has overcome the heartbreak or that he had this deep relationship with this woman, whatever it was. But, but what she is feeling, what Ruth is feeling is this idea of disappointment, whether it's disappointment in Joel, disappointment in herself, it's not totally clear, but there is this kind of mismatch between Theo and, and uh, Ruth that is adding more tension. I mean, this is only page 150. We got 50 pages to move through. We're, we're fairly, you know, I think Rachel Kong would have really been leading us astray down the garden path, as it were, 
if they if they didn't end up at least trying to get together but i do think also this is one of those times when you're like okay it's not a not a done deal they're not like you know getting engaged at the barbecue with their warm lemonade okay we're going to move on to oh so um so this is the kind of romantic strain so we have these different strains that are all being kind of uh these different pieces of her arc there's the professional piece there is the romantic piece. There's the part with her mother and her father. And then we have, um, we're, we're going to return to this idea of the professional stuff. On 173, kind of in the middle here, today I applied for sonography certification. It's a two-year program. When it's through, I can be a cardiac sonographer. So this is so cool. Now we're really getting toward the end of the novel. We're close enough to the end that we know that when the author is telling us something like this, if she doesn't return to the professional piece, we understand that, that this arc is sort of completed and we have seen real growth. This is someone who dropped out of college seven months before finishing, had a lot of potential, had good grades. And this ultrasound sonography really allowed for a lot of really interesting, um, you know, development of her throughout the novel. But then the end, this idea of her as becoming a cardiac sonographer is so cool because it's the heart, you know, like she used to do babies. She used to be, it was all about sort of birth and it was all about sort of symbiosis with the mother. And then she's moving much more toward after this year of living back at home and being kind of back in the womb and back in the nest. She's she's ready to go out into the world and she's going to be able to see people's hearts. You know, there's this real sense of her as having uh, metaphorically and not heavy handedly, but really beautifully uh, of having really grown into this this um, person whose job is actually a really beautiful metaphor for someone who is much more self-aware and a much more um, sort of responsible, um, you know, tender of the heart, or at least viewer of the heart. Okay, great. Um, and then we're going to look at 193 just quickly to tie up some of the stuff um, with Theo. So on 193 here, Theo arrived first, wearing a khaki shirt. He lingered at the threshold. I told him I liked his shirt. He said he had advice on it. He asked a waitress what he should wear on a date. She'd told him a khaki shirt. Is this a date? I asked. It's Christmas. It's never not worked, he said, referring to the shirt. A pause, and then he took my wrist and knocked my knuckles to the wooden door frame. So cute. It's so cute. So he, it's, you know, again, like this is, we are just pages from the end of the novel. In fact, that's the second to the last page of the novel. So we're really meant to sort of see this as emblematic of what's going to happen for them. And it's such a great, it's so perfect. It's kind of quirky and wacky. And, it, you know, this question of like, oh, is it a date? Like, are we moving towards something romantic? And then this real investment on his part, but in this kind of quirky way where he's saying, you know, the khaki shirt has never not worked which is information he must have gotten from the waitress, which is funny. And then this idea of, of then taking her hand and making her knock wood is just, it's so great. Wow, and that superstition, that idea of superstition really dovetails nicely with that idea of Euclid Avenue as being this superstitious. This is making me think um, that there's probably a lot of superstitious stuff all throughout the novel that I was not totally picking up on. Probably there's a whole motif of, of superstition that I maybe just kind of skimmed over. But the point is that we have really nice resolution of all of these different things. The romantic piece, she's gonna get her cardiac degree, and there's a lot of resolution also with her family that's kind of inherent in, um, in much of what we looked at. Okay, I wanna look at humor very briefly on page, well, not super briefly, because there is so much funny stuff in this book. We've touched a little bit on why it's funny, um, and it's, it's, it's a humor that's very sophisticated in some ways and also very childlike and kind of ludic. L ludic just means playful. It's very, um, it's very satisfying because it's kind of all over the place. It's sort of like there's, there's something for everyone. And there's a quirky kind of vantage on everything that is very appealing. Okay, on page 12. So she's on kind of a bender and um, with her with her friend, who is just that awesome doctor who really gives her great advice. And um, she's up at the top. Oh, sorry. She's actually not with a doctor. She's with her friend Bonnie, who's cutting, who's the hair cutter. Okay. So um, right up at the top here on page 12. 
I realize horrified that I am wearing Joel's ring. I'd been carrying it in a pocket of my purse. I can't remember putting it on. I jiggle the ring off and drop it back in the purse where the sea of junk engulfs it immediately. Bonnie is looking at me, it appears, with fondness. Are you, it occurs to me, admiring your haircut? So this is this is the kind of thing that, so the mechanics of humor are something that we can talk about. Maybe I'll do a how to read thing on humor because it's really interesting to think about the mechanics of it. But so one of the kind of most basic kind of formulas of, of humor is the idea of A plus B equals X or like A plus B equals a tomato, you know? So this idea here of like, she's in this crazy moment where she's realizing that she's, she's wearing the ring that she shouldn't be wearing and she's done it subconsciously. She doesn't remember putting it on. It's kind of this wacky moment and she's just gotten a haircut from the friend. And then she's having this kind of panic. She gets rid of the ring. And then she looks at the friend who's gazing at her fondly in this nice kind of accepting way. And as the reader, you're like, oh, her friend is like really understanding that she somehow put the ring on and took it back off. And then the the X or the tomato here is this idea that in fact, the friend is just like really admiring her own handiwork, the friend having given her the haircut. So it's that kind of unexpected part that's just really, uh, it just is, there's a, there's a certain perspective to all of the humor that I really enjoy. And then actually on the same page, down at the bottom, page 12 here, Sometimes I like a hangover because it's something to do, which is so great. I mean, that's actually just like such an excellent way. I mean, who likes a hangover really? But there is that sense of like, that kind of like oddball perspective on things that, that sort of shift things in a way that, that eases some of our suffering. Maybe that's part of the reason why I find a lot of it so appealing is because a lot of it is kind of based in a real pathos. And then we have an easing of, of whatever the pain is, whether it's a hangover or alarm that you've subconsciously put on your your engagement ring again okay um on page 45 so we have that kind of humor that is that kind of word play where you have the like a plus b equals x kind of a thing but they're also just details that i found deeply funny and quirky and enough of them that you sort of were expecting wacky things like on page 45 here um we have her uh she's talking to theo this is things are just heating up with the two of them and then I notice there are at least four other markings streaking the back of his hand. So he has these kind of scratches on his hand. My cat gave those to me, he says, because I'm the worst at not staring. So even the, just this kind of formulation, first of all, it's it's a funny detail. It's like a strange detail. And, and I find it kind of like engaging and humorous. And, and then this idea of, of because I'm the worst at not swearing, at not staring, that, that kind of like even just grammatically in the syntax there is so funny. And then on page 48, so this is a same sort of thing about this idea of her self-awareness. And I think this is a, an example of humor actually also cluing us into this idea that she's having some kind of evolution. You know, she's she's changing. Up on the top of page 48, this is, it's just so cute because this is also Theo. This is when Theo has decided that they're going to pretend that he is still, that Howard is still teaching. So he sets up these classes. And so he's taking Howard and Ruth to, you know, the, and it's so funny to me that they go to all of those places under the auspices of, of learning about California history. So they're going to the amusement park and then they're going to like panning for gold and doing all of these different things because it becomes untenable for them to be at the university but in the beginning there's this awkward moment with the mom who is very funny as well because they're all trooping out of the house and the mom is confused because as far as the mom knows the dad's not allowed to teach they change their minds is mom's reaction to dad's news about the semester of class he's going to be teaching after all and then a little bit down. She says nothing for a moment. She glances at me. My face is doing I don't know what. Again, it's the same as that notion of like, because I'm the worst at not staring. This idea of I don't, my face is doing I don't know what is so, there's something very delightful and quirky about the syntax. And also this idea of like, she's not trying to describe her face, which would be so awkward, but that you have this sense of like her face is looking kind of alarmed. And there's a certain kind of slapstick element here that's also so endearing because she and her mom are kind of sharing this moment of, of like they're all in cahoots and they're all supporting each other and also doing this really beautiful thing for her father. 
So um, the last example of humor here is on 102, and this is actually very significant. So um, we have a lot of um, found objects throughout the, the book, and that's one of those kind of things that she keeps finding are these, are these lists of things or a letter. And very significantly, one of the found objects that she is pulling from verbatim is a journal that her father started keeping of all the funny things that she said when she was little. And at the very beginning of the book around Christmas, it is a gift that she receives. So these entries from the journal are all her father's voice talking about different things that she did. And some of the humor in here was really impressive to me because I think it's very difficult to tell like cute things about kids because it just usually sounds too cute. And oftentimes parents think that their kids are saying hilarious things and it's really only cute because it's your own kid or maybe the delivery because the kid says it in a cute way or something. But I do think that a lot of these were very successful and that a lot of these entries are in fact very endearing and, and they are cute, but they're also um, funny. And this is an example of one of them. So this is, it's in italics because it's one of these found objects. It's the verbatim transcript of the journal that her father was keeping about her as a child. Today, I had to stop in the post office and you looked around and said, aghast, this is Aaron's? Which is so funny. And what's so genius about that is there's a huge setup there that she did not belabor us with. So this idea, of course, is that, you know, the little kid's like, I want to come, I want to come. And the dad's like, I'm just running errands. And they're like, I love errands. I want to do errands. Errands sounds so great. And then you get to the post office. You imagine the long line, which I love the U.S. Postal Service. I will always defend them. The mail, no one sends it anymore, but it is a miracle, a miracle the way that things can get around this country. But it is always a long line. So this kid's arriving. I mean, all of that setup is unspoken. And all you have to have is, today I had to stop by the post office and you looked around and said, aghast, this is errands? It's so funny. It's so funny. And it, it, again, it's a very difficult thing because it's kind of cutesy, but it, because of the way she delivers it and the syntax and the aghast, I mean, it, all of it is so good. So very, very impressive. But I have to kind of um, take a step back with this journal idea because one of the most poignant and most, I think, effective things in the whole, uh, in the whole novel is how this journal becomes upended. So the father gives her the journal at the beginning and it's this beautiful kind of record of her. It also is a little bit bittersweet because you're, you're like in the back of my mind, I'm like, I don't think Linus gets a journal. Like I just was like, I think that maybe the bloom was off the rose when Linus came along or the dad was drinking a lot or like whatever the thing was. So, it, it, well, I guess he wasn't drinking again until Linus was in eighth grade. But you have this sense that that really this is his favorite child and it's, it's a person who was deeply moving to him and someone who uh, really, you know, brought a lot of revelation and a lot of joy and a lot of warmth into uh, into the father's life. So the father has this journal and then, of course, the really moving thing is when the daughter starts keeping her own journal for her father. So she starts and it's, 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 um, it's essentially formulated in the same way. Today you did this, today you did that. And the thing that is so poignant and so touching and so sad about that is that the daughter is able to read her journal and she's able to sort of have this vantage of her life that's this incredibly reverent and, and loving and compassionate and interested view of, of her, which is, I mean, what a gift for a child. And then she's writing this one for her father that he will never be able to appreciate, which is just, it's, it's, it's so poignant and so heartbreaking in exactly the right way. So on 189, uh, we're going to take a look at this as we are moving toward the close of the novel. But this is a um, sort of an acknowledgement of this really sad kind of role reversal that you have this really heartbreaking idea. I mean, it would be sad enough, the fact that this role reversal is happening and that he used to be the one keeping the journal of the funny things. And now the daughter is having to take on this parental role. But I think, again, you need to ask yourself, like, sort of, so what? and take it one step further and understand that the real tragedy here is that he will never, this is not a, a, a journal that is going to be moving for him. It's not a journal that will ever have the same resonance as the journal he was keeping. 
So um, here on page 189, today you put a whole cabbage into our Rongo Showtime rotisserie. Today into the enormous salad I was making, you slam dunked a whole tomato. Today you took my hand and filed a nail the way people do to babies. Today I caught you in the garage eating the peaches from the earthquake kit. I joined you. We drank the syrup and then we drank the packets of water. Here I am in lieu of you collecting the moments. So well done. It's so beautiful. And this idea of collecting the moments, that is what he had done for her. But again, um, these are going to be lost on him, tragically. Okay. Um, so then we have the, this beautiful clothes, which again is quirky and wacky, and I just loved it. So on the end, we're going to finish by reading this last page. And I'm not going to do too much uh, analysis. I'm just going to really let you revel in the prose here. This is on page 194 at the end. You carved the turkey and you carved the ham and we drank John's cocktails and you binge drank Shirley Temple's and dad, you were making fun of mom's affinity for reggae, which she blamed us for. She only got into it because we loved dancing to it as babies. So I love this. Again, this is this journal that she is keeping, but it also, it, it's, um, it's, it's really this poignant and again, sort of bittersweet and kind of funny but 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 sad idea of 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 sort of looking back at, at a time when they were babies and also reggae like it just is so funny it's 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 a perfect blending of pathos and and of humor and then um a little further down this is the last kind of chunk and much later after everybody is gone when it is just the four of us again and we've dealt with all the dishes this is what you do you turn the low doorknobs and we walk single file out the door, staying within sight of one another in our light colored clothes. Testing, testing, Linus says over a walkie talkie. Roger that, I respond. It's after midnight by now, meaning it isn't Christmas anymore. It's an ordinary, regular night and I prefer it, to be honest. The moon is doing something beautiful. Mom's trailing you, clutching your little finger. She pulls a peeled orange from her jacket pocket and hands it to Linus to distribute the segments. Mom's brought you an orange, Dad, Linus says. Do you copy? I copy, you say. Then, over and out. And all of us follow your lead, one after the other, into the darkness, over and over, out, out, out. So beautiful. So beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful and it's quirky and it's funny, this over and out. I mean, over and out, the idea of the walkie-talkies is, you know, this this notion that they will be able to communicate across space and distance and time, it, which is so poignant because they, you know, will be losing that ability. And then this notion of of over and out, you know, as as really like over and out, like I mean, it's also walkie-talkie talk, just meaning like I'm gonna sign off now. But obviously, this idea of signing off now is is much more poignant when this, you know. It's the, it's the end of a year. It's the end of the novel. It's the end of what we're going to see. And then following him into the darkness, following his lead, and then is over and over and over, out, out, out. Just beautiful. That is where we are going to end. Um, incredible. I mean, an incredible, incredible book here, Goodbye Vitamin. Just such a delight but also so poignant and so important and such a good look at the just difficulties of being a family and, and, and being biracial and being um, you know, a daughter and heartbreak and Alzheimer's, we can call it Augusts. Um, but it just is really, it's, it's, I just, I really loved it. So I hope that this 90 minutes was helpful and that you got a lot out of it. And I hope that you head back to the Fox page to find out something else to read and listen to. Okay. Thanks for tuning in.